Chapter 19, Bob O'Farrell. The scene is instant, whole and wonderful, in its beauty and design that vision of the soaring stands, that pattern of 40,000 impetal faces, the velvet and unalterable geometry of the playing field, and the small lean figures of the players, set there lonely, tense, and waiting in their places. Bright, desperate at players set there, or excuse me, desperate, solitary atoms, encircled by that huge wall of nameless faces is incredible. And more than anything, it is the light and the miracle of light in shade and color. The crisp blue light and swiftly slant out from the soaring stands and deep evening to violet begins to march across the velvet field and towards the pitcher's box. That gives the thing its single and incomparable beauty. The batter stands swinging his bat and grimly waiting at the plate. Crouch tense, the catcher crouched, the umpire bent hand, and hands collapsed behind the, his back and peering forward. All of them are set now in the cold blue of that slanting shadow, except the pitcher who stands out of out there all alone, calm, desperate, and forsaken. In his isolation with the gold-red... At swiftly fading light that it upon him, his figure legible all with all the resolution, despair, and lonely dignity which that slanting, somehow fatal light can give him. Thomas Wolfe of the Time and the River. In 1924, and a foul tip came back, crashed through my mask, and fractured my skull. It was my own fault. It was, it was an old mask, and I knew I shouldn't have worn it. You know, a lot of times a catcher's mask gets so banged, banging around, it's it gets it's dented here and there. If you try to bend it back the the way it's supposed to be, it weakens it. Well, I put on an old mask that day and asked the clubhouse boy to get me my regular one. Before he could get back with it, the ball had spun off the bat. Smashed through the mask, it knocked me unconscious. I had caught almost all the Cubs games the two previous seasons. Hit a solid 320 both years. Gabby Hartnett had came up to the Cubs in, two that, er, in 1922. He was sort of crowding me, but the catcher's job was mine until I got my fractured skull. I didn't play much the rest of that season. However, the next year the Cubs traded me to the St. Louis Cardinals. A good break for me, I guess, now that I look back at it. At the time, I thought I was broke, broken hearted. I st well, it still turned out for the best, because the Cardinals won the pennant in the 1926. And when I was voted the league's most valuable player that year, we won the World Series, too. That was the World Series, the most famous one against the Yankees, where... Old Grover Cleveland Alexander, at the tail end of his long career, came in late in the seventh inning or in the seventh game to strike out Tony Lazari and save the series for the Cardinals. I guess that's maybe the most famous strikeout the whole history of baseball, wouldn't you say? I caught Alex for years on the Cubs before we were both traded to the Cardinals. I think he was as good as for or better than any pitcher who ever lived. He had perfect control and a great screwball. He used to call it a fadeaway, same as Matthewson. I don't believe Alex was much of a drinker before he went to the army. After he got back from the war, though, he had a real problem. When he struck out Tony Lazari, he'd been out of on a drunk the night before and was still feeling the effects. See, Alex had pitched for us the day before and won. He beaten the Yankees in the second game of the World Series, and again in the sixth game. Pitching the complete game both times, he was 39 years old then, and naturally wasn't expecting to see any more action. However, the sixth game was over. Roger Hornsby, our manager, told Alex that if Jesse Haynes got in any trouble the next day, he would be the relief man, so he should take care of himself. Well, Alex didn't really intend to take a drink that night, but some of his friends got a hold of him. 
and thought they were doing him, him a favor by buying him a drink. Well, you weren't doing Alex any favor by buying him a drink, because he just couldn't stop. So in the seventh game of the seventh game, Alex is tied asleep in the bullpen, sleeping off in the night before. When trouble comes, we had one each won three games in the series, and now all the chips are down. The score is 3-2 in our favor going into the bottom of the seventh and then in of the seventh game. Jesse Haynes pitching for us again. Herb Pennick the Yan- for the Yankees. Suddenly, Haynes start- starts to tire. The Yankees get the bases loaded with two out, and the next batter up is Tony Lazari. Roger Hornsby and I get... Uh, they're around Haynes at the pitcher's mound. These fingers are a massive blisters from throwing so many knuckleballs, and so Hornsby decides to call in old Alex. Even though we know oh, he'd pitched the day before and had been up most of the night, so and he comes shuffling in slowly from the bullpen to the pitching mound. Can you do it? asked Hornsby. I can try, says Alex. We tried the uh, Alex. We agree that Alex should pitch. Lazary low and away. Nothing up high. Well, the first pitch is a perfect low curve for strike one. But the second one comes in high, and Tony smacks a vicious line drive that lands in the left field stands, but just foul. Oh, it's foul. By maybe 10 feet. Actually, from home plate, I can see it's going to be foul. All the way, because it's curving from the time to get halfway out there. Of course, I'm giving it plenty of body English, too, just to make sure. The pitch had been high, so I run out to Alex. I thought uh, we were going to pitch him low and outside. You'll never get another one like that, Alex says. And he didn't. The next pitch was a low outside curve and Tony Lazary struck out. Fanned him with three pitches. Most people seem to remember that as happening in the ninth inning and ending the ball game. It didn't. It was the only the seventh inning and we had two innings still to go. In the eighth, Alex set down the Yankees in order and the first two men in the ninth, both then and two out out in in the bottom of the ninth, we walked Babe Ruth, got Bob Musil was next up, but on the first pitch to him, the Babe took off for second. Alex pitched, and I fired the ball to Hornsby and caught Babe stealing, and that was the last play of the game in the series. You know, I wondered why Ruth tried to steal second then. A year or two later, I went on a barnstorming trip with the Babe, and I asked him the Ruth said he thought Alex had forgotten where and he was there. Also that the way Alex was pitching, they'd never get it two hits in a row off of him. So he better get in position to score if they got one. Well, maybe that was a good thinking, maybe not. In any case, I had had cut him about a mile at second. Er, I had him out in a, mo- a mile at second, excuse me. The most fantastic thing in to, of all happened. The winter, the Cardinals up and trade Roger Hornsby to the Giants for Frankie Frisch and Jimmy Ring. They trade away the manager of the world champions, who also happens to be a guy who had hit over 400 in the three of his last five seasons. Boy. That really shook us up. Traded away our, a national hero. And top it off, who do they make the new St. Louis manager? Me. Huh? What a posi- What position to be in, huh? Hornsby couldn't get along with the owner, Sam Breeden. And in a way, I would end up as the GOAT. I didn't want to be the manager. I was in the prime of my career, only 30 years old, and... Managing will always take something away from your playing. Nevertheless, we almost won the pennant again in 1927. Lost to the Pirates by only a, a, a game and a half. 
but we didn't win it, so the following season, I wasn't the manager anymore. I found myself traded to the Giants early in 1928. Hornsby was a great manager as far as I've concerned that year. In St. Louis, he was topped. He never bothered any of us. Just let you play your own game. He was fine. Of course, they say later on he couldn't get along with the players. Got a little bossy, they say. Seems like the chain he changed. But as far as I'm concerned, he was great. Now John McGraw was a rough manager. Very hard to play for. He play, played for him from um, 1928 to 1932 and when he retired. And I didn't like it. You couldn't seem to do anything right for him ever if something went wrong it was always your fault not his maybe it was because he was getting old and he was a sick man but he never or was any fun to play for or he was always so grouchy i remember one time bill terry was at bat with the count three balls and no strikes on him mcgraw let him hit Bill hit a home run right out of the park. He's as he's coming back to the dugout. McGraw said, uh, "I'll take half of that one," meaning he should get some credit for letting Bill hit away with the count three and three nothing. You can't, uh, you can have it all. Terry says, "No, McGraw was never a very cheerful man to be around. At least that's my opinion. The greatest player I ever saw. Oh." I don't know. There were so many great ones. Like guys like Paul Wayner, Hornsby, Alex, Terry, Grover Cleveland, Terry, Hubble, Ruth, Vance, Mel Ott, Rixey, Roush, Roush, excuse me. There were too many great ones to say any one and is the greatest. Although I'll say this, the greatest player I ever saw in any one in, in, in in season was Frank. In one season was Frankie Frisch in 1927. This was his first year with the Cardinals. When I was managing him, he'd been traded to St. Louis for the man of of the hour, Roger Hornsby, and he was on the spot. Frank did everything that year. Really, an amazing ball player. Hmm. You know, I always thought it was pretty wonderful to be a ball player. I was a Chicago White Sox fan and. Until one day in 1915 when I was about eight year, a kid, eight years old. That must have been in 1905. My dad took me to see the White Sox play. There was his team. Billy Sullivan was the catcher. And I thought he really was something. I wanted to be another Billy Sullivan and catch for the White Sox. And naturally, like all good White Sox fans, the team I hated the most was the Chicago Cubs. In 1915, finished high school, I was just as rapid as a White Sox fan as ever. I was catching for the local Waukegan semi-pro team then. One day, in the middle of the summer, we played an exhibition game with the hated Chicago Cubs. Well, lo and behold, after the game, the Cubs offered me a contract. I grabbed it up, and suddenly, after all those years of being a White Sox fan, there I was, all of all things, a Cubs fan. So, what happened when he was traded to the Cardinals? I don't know. The exact same magical transformation took place in Dad. Fact is, my dad saw just about every Cub home game all the years I was with them, which was until 1925, then I... Like I said, I was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals, and then, of course, we both became Cardinals fans. Today, I'm still a Cardinals fan. Had a boy. Even though I never caught as many games for them as I did for the Cubs, or later for the Giants, for that matter. I was in the big leagues an awfully long time, you know. I think longer than any other catcher. 21 years from 1915 through 1935. Roger Bersanahan was the manager of the Cubs when I I joined them in 1915. The old giant catcher from way back, the guy who caught Matthewson and Rube Marquard and all the rest of them, the man who invented shin guards back in 1908 or so. How about that? Hard to believe they never caught without shin guards, isn't it? But he was the... the blah, blah, blah. 
He was the first to ever wear them. Mr. Bersanahan helped me a, a great deal. He more er, or less showed me the ropes and taught me how to catch. He was still all on that team. Bersanahan, er, he was still catching then, not too, though not too much. There actually were three catchers on that team. Bersanahan, Jimmy Archer, and Bubbles Hargrave. Four, I guess, if you include me. Except for Bersanahan, nobody paid any attention to me. I didn't get any in many games. I was straight out of high school, and I mostly just sat at around and watched. Of course, aside Bersanahan, nobody helped me any. You know, any. They didn't want me want a rookie to come in and take one of their, their buddy's jobs, but they weren't too bad. They just gave, just more or less ignored me. Next year, I only got in one game before they shipped me out to Peoria, Illinois, in the 3I League. In the year after that, I played with Peoria until the Cubs recalled me up. Near the end of the season after I, that, I stayed up. Those were the days that when catching was really rough. There were so many offbeat pitches that, then you know, like the spitball, the Amori ball, the shine ball, you name it, and somebody threw it. The Amori ball, the pitcher would hide an Amori cloth inside the sleeve or inside his glove, rub the ball on it, that would make a slight rough spot, and boy, would that ball ever break. Some pitchers would raise an eyelet on their glove, you know, where the lacing goes through. Well, they raise one of the eyelets up and scratch the ball on it. Then it would it'd act the same as an Amori ball. That really take off. Those things weren't legal. You had to, be, to do them on the shy. Oops. Eddie S- Sitcott had a great shine ball. He'd, he'd have some transparent paraffin on his trousers or somewhere, or some talcum powder when in every chance he'd get, he'd rub the ball there. That would make the ball slide off his fingers and put a real break on it when it came up to the plate. Acted something like a spitter. A catcher's life wasn't easy. I certainly enjoyed those years, though. I didn't get a little, or I did get a little discouraged at times, but I guess you do in any job. Of course, when you played every day, it gets to be sort of like work. Somebody way a dent on deep. It's still a play, just like the umpires say. Play ball. It is. It's play.